Princeton's operating on the border that are operating entirely outside of the law. Princeton's Bridging Divides initiative is working with the data to better understand political violence. They've studied strategies for de-escalating conflicts at all levels. Now, that includes local school board and election meetings where there have been increases in disruptions by specific groups. The people behind the initiative also say while these concerns are up, so is a movement with a positive mission that supports racial healing. It talks about sort of what does healing look like as a society too and helps to envision that sort of future state. I think it's also about working to, to envision together what it means to move forward, um, what it move, means to move forward together in an inclusive democracy. So uh, for us, that means, you know, ensuring everyone feels welcome to have their voice heard in that local meeting. The Bridging Divides Initiative is helping teach de-escalation techniques, including for poll workers. Tomorrow, five more states hold midterm primaries that include at least one far-right candidate. All right, Chris, thank you so much. Meantime, it was a violent weekend in here at home with two shootouts and two nights in downtown Detroit. On Saturday night, Detroit police say officers shot and injured a man during a gunfight between several suspects near Congress and Bush. Then on Friday, two bystanders were caught in the crossfire near Cadillac Square and Randolph. Detroit's police chief blaming visitors to the city, bringing guns and wreaking havoc downtown. And though arrests have been made, more questions are being asked about a plan to prevent gun violence. 7 Action News reporter Simon Shaked is demanding accountability from the department, and he joins us live now right outside public safety headquarters in downtown Detroit. Simon. Carolyn, the chief points out there was a noticeable police presence there in the area at the time this happened. In fact, officers actually witnessed the shooting. And furthermore, he says three suspects who were all armed on Saturday night came from nearby East Point. Two of them hit with gunfire during an exchange between groups. Police made two arrests for carrying concealed weapons and planned to make a third after having to return fire near Sweetwater Tavern on East Congress. The two suspects hospitalized are expected to survive. Now this comes after a separate shooting Friday near Cadillac Square where two, passing, two people passing by, a 17-year-old girl and 22-year-old man were shot and hospitalized. Two suspects there on the run and police now pledging to implement an updated strategy to ensure public safety. Part of that, arresting spectators who gather for dangerous driving. As for the shootings, take a listen. I don't think this was a manpower issue. I mean, the officers literally witnessed it. I mean, they were on top of the scene. Uh, you know, we've got a very strategic uh, deployment strategy that we operate with every single day. And we look at where we want to be, where we, and we deploy assets in a number of different ways. So uh, I don't think it's a, a, a personnel issue. Just they were there. Coming up at five, what a well-known community leader is now vowing to do, and why a new drifting video has the attention of police as well. Live downtown, Simon Shaket, 7 Action News. Back to you, Carolyn. All right, thank you so much, Simon. Glad you're getting answers for us. We'll see you on later editions of Action News. Now we're gonna to turn to the latest on the coronavirus pandemic as new coronavirus infections continue to rise across Michigan. Schools and workplaces are taking action aimed at stemming the state's spring surge. All of the Detroit Three are bringing back COVID protocols. Four, General Motors and Stellantis implementing mask mandates at plants located in counties labeled high risk. The latest data from the CDC show COVID-19 community levels in six southeast Michigan counties are now in the high risk category. As a result, Ferndale Public Schools is once again requiring facial coverings indoors. The district says it will do everything it can to keep students and staff safe. Royal Oak Schools is highly recommending masking indoors for students. Both districts say they will stay in touch with the Oakland County Health Department to monitor COVID rates. Also today, Detroit health officials kicked off a new program to fight the spread of the virus. The city is handing out free antiviral drugs to people who qualify based on vaccination status and individual health risks. Free COVID-19 testing and medical screenings will also be available. Services are available at the Joseph Walker Williams Center on Detroit's west side. All right, let's head outside now for a live look over the Motor City. The work week getting off to a wet start after a round of heavy rain moved through Metro Detroit overnight. Most of it has since moved out, but we are still dealing with some scattered storms out there. 
Here is Chief Meteorologist Dave Rexroth with a look at what we are seeing right now. Dave? Yeah, this band, a uh, little scattered showers and thunderstorms moving out ahead of a cold front. It's working its way from northwest to southeast. <clears throat> Here's a wide view of what's going on. You can see the clearing back behind us already in Lansing. Nothing but pure sunshine there. So this will move through. Most of it is done by 5. At the latest, it's done by 6 o'clock. Northern Lapeer, a couple of stripes here working toward Port Huron. A little hot and heavy right on the lake there, just north side of Port Huron and uh, Sarnia, then some scattered action, which is most uh, intense, I think, in Mount Clemens. Out over Lake St. Clair, there's actually marine uh, concern here uh, because of the thunderstorms there, but most spots south of Detroit have already cleared out already. So uh, here we go, scattered storms around early this evening, moving from northwest to southeast. Some small hail and winds to 45 are the strongest. That's not severe, but certainly gets your attention, especially if you're out there on the water. It gets cooler a couple of days, then it warms up. That might be a problem with storms. Some rain likely, too. We'll show you how much on Wednesday coming up. All right, Dave. We'll talk to you in just a bit. And with strong storms on the radar, be sure to check out our free weather app to track conditions right in your own neighborhood in real time. It's all free with the 7 app, so make sure you download it today. All right, now we're going to turn to the nationwide shortage of infant formula. Right now, an average of 43% of formula varieties are unavailable on store shelves. And several states have more than 50% of various kinds of formula out of stock. The shortage spurred by the closure of the largest formula production plant in the U.S. The FDA shut down the Sturgis, Michigan facility for Abbott Labs back in February due to unsanitary conditions. Well, now the Biden administration is expected to announce an agreement that would pave the way to reopen the plant. Right now, though, we're going to send it back to Chris Stewart with some of the other steps just announced by the White House to help ease this shortage that is causing so many problems. Chris. The White House is working to do more to ease the baby formula shortage. Leaders today saying that they're offering to work with ingredient producers to help speed up manufacturing as well as organizing transportation. Now, this is in addition to a website recently launched to help caregivers track down the formula they need. HHS.gov slash formula has links to formula companies as well as community resources. Meantime, the FDA commissioner is promising to look into why it took the agency so long to investigate reports of tainted formula. The first reports of babies getting sick from the formula came in September, but the FDA didn't inspect the Abbott Nutrition Plant until January. At least five babies got sick, two died. The commissioner says the FDA will investigate its timeline to make sure no mistakes are repeated. Home sales are expected to drop because of rising interest rates. We're getting answers on why that still may not bring prices down to what we were seeing before the pandemic and when the hot market could finally cool a bit. All right, thank you so much, Chris. Also ahead on 7 Action News at 4, gas prices soaring to another record high. What is fueling the latest surge and why experts say we'll be paying over $4 a gallon for months. That and more still ahead on 7 Action News at 4. We are back in just a moment. Some relief could be coming for people priced out of the housing market as home prices rent and inflation rise. President Biden's housing supply action plan released today includes addressing construction supply chain issues, new financing options for manufactured and multifamily housing, and directing more government owned housing toward owner occupants rather than large companies. The goal is to end the housing supply shortage in five years. Well, housing prices have gone up by more than 20% across the country in the last year. The Federal Reserve recently raised interest rates to address this, but a big question now is how long will it take to see the effects from this on the hot market? I'm Alexa Liaco. The half percent interest rate hike is the biggest interest rate hike in more than two decades, and it's all an effort to slow inflation, but it's going to make it more expensive to make big purchases like buying a car, but most importantly, buying a home. The National Association of Realtors expects home sales to drop 9% during 2022 compared to 2021 because of rising interest rates. 
But even if that happens, average prices are projected to be about 5% higher than they were in 2019 before the pandemic. That's mainly because there isn't enough housing inventory nationwide. Experts at Rocket Mortgage say the interest rate increase could actually make the inventory problem even worse. For people who were on the fence about selling their house, they may now wait to put their homes on the market. Existing homeowners are often locked into a much lower interest rate than they could get now, so that may make people wait a few months or even into next year when interest rates may go down. The average 30-year fixed home loan rate is now over 5%. That's up more than two percentage points since the year began. So that means if you bought an average price house for around $375,000, you'd be paying an extra $440 every month for your mortgage payment if you buy your house now versus what you would have paid in December. The Fed is expected to increase interest rates a half percent again at its meeting in June and then a half percent in July. Experts say by the end of this year, interest rates could be as much as 3% higher than they are today. I'm Alexa Liaco. Alexa, thank you. Now you can now get a good look at the chance your home will be damaged in a wildfire, not just now, but over the next 30 years. This is the First Street Foundation wildfire model. It is a first of its kind assessment of properties that does take climate change into account. The darker color, the higher the risk. The data will be integrated into Realtor.com and be called Fire Factor. It is another thing to take into consideration when you're buying a home, similar to the Flood Factor, which analyzes a property's flooding risk. All right, thank you so much, Chris. Fire crews appear to be getting a, a wildfire in the northern part of Michigan's Lower Peninsula under control. The Blue Lakes Fire has burned around 2,200 acres in uh, Mount Morrency and Cheboygan counties. As of today, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources says the fire was around 75% contained. The DNR saying the blaze likely began because of a lightning strike last week. More than 30 DNR firefighters and staff from four other departments worked through the weekend to contain the blaze. Michigan's annual spring click it or ticket seat belt enforcement period kicked off today. Over the next three weeks, law enforcement will be out looking for drivers not wearing their seat belts. Violators will face fines of $65. The traffic safety campaign runs through. June 5th. And boy, they do not play. They're like, pull it over! So you don't want to do that. Put your seatbelt on. Anyway, Sounds let's like there's some personal experience involved. Anyway, in there. let's get you back outside now for a live look over the Detroit River. A couple of storms out there right now. Nothing to really be concerned about. That's according to this man don't who you just heard subject. chiming in. Seven First Alert Chief Meteorologist Dave Rexroth. You tracking some storms? Uh, right? Yeah, a couple still out there. <laughs> it's not going to be a huge problem. I'll show you where they're heavy. It's just a little bit. This is kind of fun. I'll get out of the way for you. I'll be back. Uh, but I want to get, let you just see the sky here. And uh, actually, I can't get out of the way because I want to show you. Watch how the clouds start to build up right here. A little bit more, a little bit more. And the first rain comes through right there. And then you can see some rain falling off in the horizon there, too. A cool stock time lapse set up uh, this morning for us, which is really nice by Kevin Jeans. So here's what's happening. The heavier reaction is in northern Lapeer. And then it's moving toward, everything's moving toward the southeast. Most of the heavy action in Port Huron is moving out now. Then some scattered moderate showers, the rest of it, so that's not a big deal. So already the heaviest has moved away. Uh, there is a cold front in the west part of the state, and you can see out ahead of it, we got the action. Another cold front up here by Green Bay, so it's kind of a series of cooling events, if you will. Uh, so we were in the 70s, mid 70s today. We'll drop off a little bit as we go along. It's going to build in here a little bit, but the point is the amount of rain from last night is actually pretty heavy in some spots. Some areas estimated to be two to three inches in those heavy downpours. As we move into Wednesday, which after the next couple of hours is our next rain chance, it's a lot less. So this will be probably not the brightest day on Wednesday, uh, but we'll have a bright day before then and after that as well. A uh, little scattered showers coming on Wednesday. This evening, the storms move out. I think most of it's done by six o'clock. Most of the heavy stuff is already done. 70 degrees or so is an eight o'clock temperature in Detroit. 49 overnight, anywhere from clear to partly cloudy skies. It's calm tomorrow as well. Notice the temperatures not in the 70s anymore, not in the 80s anymore. 69 on Tuesday, 63 on Wednesday, with a shower is pretty likely here. Back to the sunshine Thursday. Look at the quick jump to 76 and then 87 on Friday. We get that hot plus a wind field late in the day, anywhere between late in the day, Friday, through Friday evening, Friday night to Saturday morning, there could be some storms here that are a bit too strong with that kind of energy. So we'll watch that for you with the next batch of rain after tonight.